Cellular respiration. Uh, further information it can be found at cellular respiration and fermentation articles. So, cellular respiration is a metabolic uh, is a set of metabolic reactions and processes that take place in the cells of organisms to convert chemical energy from nutrients into adenosine triphosphate or ATP, which is essentially the uh, energy currency or energy uh, molecule, and then release waste. Product. The reactions involved in respiration are catabolic reactions, which break down or yeah, break large molecules into smaller ones, releasing energy because weak, high energy bonds, in particular in uh, molecular oxygen or dioxygen O2, yeah, are replaced by stronger bonds in the products, and uh, hence why oxygen is uh, is usually involved in uh, redox reactions. And yes, yeah, so going further, so respiration is one of the key ways a cell releases chemical energy to fuel cellular activity. The overall reaction occurs in a series of biochemical steps, some of which are redox reactions. Uh, although cellular respiration is technically a combustion reaction, it clearly does not resemble one when it occurs in a living cell because of the slow, controlled release of energy from the series of reactions. So yes, yeah, so this is a very interesting one. So yeah, so essentially, cellular respiration could be viewed as slow motion uh, combustion. Yes, yeah, slow motion. Yeah. So when you think of uh, combustion, you think of uh, burning wood, but actually, your your cell, your body, and cells do that every single uh, day, but in a slow, uh, yeah, slow controlled manner with a bunch of steps. Some of them aren't redox steps in between, but overall, it could still be viewed as a combustion reaction from start to finish. So Emmius note. So here is. The combustion reaction of, uh, or this is here's the burning of food to uh, heat and energy, or in other words, the consumption of food and the cellular respiration. So basic overview, overview of energy in human life. So you have chemical energy, carbohydrates, fats, and others. You have a bunch of food, energy in human life. So you consume that, and then this converts it into ATP bodies, uh, quote energy currency, and then you have the metabolism uh, breaks it down and uses it for energy and then releases heat. So you have, and also in the conversion to ATP, you also uh, release heat. And as well as uh, other chemical waste such as carbon dioxide and water, even in the just the chewing and uh, initial breakdown of the uh, larger uh, food molecules. And yes, so very fascinating stuff. All right, so going further, and now uh, here is an overview of uh, respiration in a eukaryotic cell. So this figure, we'll go over the terms uh, in this section shortly. So this is glycolysis in the cytoplasm. Here's some metabolic pathways. Uh, this has this involves uh, two ATP energy investment stage, and then a bunch of kind of uh, reactions over here, and then uh, over here you gain uh, energy harvesting stage. So you gain two ATP in this so plus four. So initially you need ATP for this stage, but you can make uh, four ATPs. So a net gain eight two ATP. And then he goes through this uh, citric acid cycle in the mitochondria and involves a, a electron transport uh, chain yeah, on this uh, lipid bilayer over here. And a cycle right here where it involves, it involves gaining ATP and releasing CO2 as waste, so carbon dioxide as waste over there, and a bunch of other uh, reactions all involved in this. And so on. So let's go further, and we're going to get to. We're going to look at this uh, consistently. So sugar in the form of glucose, uh, C six H twelve O O six, is the main nutrient used by animal and plant cells in respiration. So that's this uh, uh, glucose right here, and here it just has the shorthand for C six, uh, just to illustrate the carbon part. C six, and the, these are the other parts of it. And uh, yeah, so cellular respiration involving oxygen is called aerobic uh, respiration yeah, or aerobic respiration, which has four stages, glycolysis, and then the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, and it has electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. And yeah, so it basically it has glycolysis over here and a citric acid cycle, which involves this uh, electron transport uh, chain. Yeah, so glycolysis is a metabolic process that occurs in the cytoplasm uh, where, whereby glucose is converted into two pyruvates, uh, CH3COCOO- uh, which are the, again, the conjugate acids of, uh, yeah, I think it's pyruvic acid. Let's go over here. It's all the way over here. Yeah, so uh, pyruvic acid is over here. 
and uh, a uh, pyruvate is a conjugate base, a conjugate base of this. So remove the H, you get this right there. And uh, yeah, so it's a functional, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a intermediate uh, in several metabolic pathways throughout the cell. So this is going to be inside the cytoplasm, which is everything except the nucleus inside the cell. And then, yeah, so it's a metabolic process that occurs in a cytoplasm whereby glucose is converted into two pyruvates uh, with two net molecules of ADP being produced at the same time. And the overall process of gly glycolysis yeah, is uh, you'll have glucose plus 2NAD plus plus 2 ADP, ADP plus 2PI then goes to 2 pyruvate plus 2NADH plus 2H plus plus 2 ATP. We'll get to these in a bit, but you can see the overview right here. So you have, yeah, so you have here, let's go back here. So this has 2 ADP, so diphosphate. So it would need 2 ATPs to convert into di uh, ADP. So you have adeno triphosphate, adenosine triphosphate, and then this one is adenosine diphosphate. So you need two of those phosphates uh, inside, or you need, yeah, you need energy investment of two ATPs which uh, you'll lose the triphosphate and become a, a diphosphate. So you lose a phosphate. So essentially you have the, the glucose and you, you add a phosphate to uh, each of these and you'll have glucose and a fructose type of uh, phosphates over there. And the next one you'll need a 2NAD plus. So the yeah, 2NAD plus and then that forms a 2NADH, which gets it over here. And here it needs two uh, extra P's or phosphates, I believe. And then you get uh, this molecule, and the next step is again another conversion with a bunch of this this stuff, and you gain a uh, net gain of two ATP because you you need a two ATP over here. So you have a, uh, in this stage you have four plus four ATP energy harvesting stage, and then it releases some water there, and it converts uh, two ADP to two ATP in this stage, and and this one over here is two ADP into two AT two ATP, so four uh, ATPs. And uh, yeah, so let's just go over what these NAD plus are, and et cetera. And again, yeah, so this, this stage is in the cytoplasm, and this is the mitochondria. So this is in the cytoplasm outside uh, everything inside the cell, but the uh, nucleus. Uh, yeah, so inside there, that's what it occurs. And let's go to the next step. So uh, this one right here, so it has NAD and NADH, this is NAD plus. So uh, nicodinamide, or actually I think it's pronounced uh, nico, uh, nicotinamide, yeah, so nicotinamide uh, adenine uh, dinucleotide, NAD, is a coenzyme central to metabolism. Found in all living cells, uh, N NAD is called a dinucleotide because it consists of two nucleotides joined through their phosphate groups. Uh, one nucleotide contains an adenine nucleobase, hence the name ad uh, adenine. Yeah, or uh, adenine, yeah, so adenine nucleobase, hence the name there uh, over here, and two, and dinucleotides. Uh, so it has two nucleotides, and uh, adenine uh, with the, one of the, uh, one of the nucleotide contains an adenine nucleobase, and the other contains, uh, and, and the other, uh, ni nicodinamide. Uh, actually, uh, I think this is pronounced uh, nicotinamide, like nicotine. Uh, yeah, so nicotinamide. Uh, NAD exists in two forms, an oxidized, uh, which is a lost in electron, and reduced, which is gains in electron form, abbreviated as NAD plus for the oxidized, and NADH, uh, H is for hydrogen, and this is for the um, reduced, respectively. Uh, the NAD plus addition sign reflects the formal charge on one of its nitrogen atoms. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, actually in regard to the nitrogen atom instead of the actual full molecule. This species is actually a singly charged anion carrying a negative ionic charge of one. Uh, under yeah, and this is under conditions of physiological pH or normal pH. Uh, NADH, in contrast, is a doubly charged anion. In other words, it's actually minus two. Yeah, so these pl this plus sign is to do with the a uh, specific nitrogen atom, and it's uh, changing the charge, or it, or it's a formal charge. We'll get to that in a bit. So uh, note that NADH, because uh, even though that uh, this is this is a plus, but this one has a uh, hydrogen, where hydrogen is is usually a plus because it's a, pro, a proton. Uh, so NADH is actually carrying a charged hydrogen molecule with two electrons. Uh, so uh, so then the net charge is a H uh, negative. So it's a negative one charge. That's because you have hydrogen, which is a plus, and then you have two electrons, 
as opposed to one as opposed to one or zero. So that makes it ne two negatives, and there's a plus, it becomes a negative one. Thus, the charges cancel. That is NAD uh, plus plus H minus is equal to NADH with no net charge. So if this is a uh, plus there, and you add this one here, yeah, and you add this uh, negative uh, charge there, these cancel. No uh, no net charge. And uh, yeah, actually, this is a no net charge on the nitrogen atom. Yeah, so it's specifically with the nitrogen atom uh, as opposed to, uh, yeah, as opposed to, yeah, the full amount there. Because uh, NADH is actually uh, two negatives. Yeah, so it's actually a minus two doubly charged anion, uh, and the other one is minus one. So we'll, we'll explain that in a bit. So a formal charge, or FC or Q, in the covalent view of bonding is a charge assigned to an atom and a molecule, assuming that electrons and all chemical bonds are shared equally between atoms regardless of relative electronegativity. And uh, here's an example of this. So if, the, if you have this uh, molecule, is an ozone molecule, which is O3. So formal charge is an ozone and the, and the nitrate anion. So a nitrate, uh, nitrate is NO3 uh, and then minus. So if this one here, uh, O3 has no net charge, except this, this one right here would be considered a plus charge, and this is a minus charge, but then overall is a, is a zero charge. And this one here is overall is negative one, but specifically the N is a plus, and then this O is a minus, and this O is a minus right here. And that makes it, uh, yeah, two minus, yeah, yeah, so negative two, then plus one, that's just negative one. Yeah, now uh, here's a formula for the formal charge, and basically formal charge is just uh, equal to the unbonded electrons minus the bonded electrons. And uh, this is specifically, the unbonded is the number of valence electrons in the neutral atom. And note that the neutral atom is when the net charge is zero. So in nitrogen's case, it's five electrons. And then, uh, so when you have five electrons, when nitrogen has five electrons, it has a neutral charge. Um, this is five electrons in a valence. And uh, valence is just the outer electron. So here is a simplified model of it, of nitrogen. So nitrogen has seven protons, seven neutrons, and seven electrons, and electrons orbit the uh the protons and neutrons or the nucleus so you have seven protons here and then this is a plus charge so that's seven plus and then you have uh then you have uh two uh, electrons in the inner shell right here then you have the outer shell has five so the, so it has five valence electrons that's a 5e there and so that's total seven so you have seven electrons like that is negative and seven protons Th these cancel out as zero charge and neutrons are all zero charge so electron arrangements are two and five and i got this figure from this uh link right here periodic table guide.com all right so so we're calculating formal charge here so that's the unbonded number of valence electrons in a neutral atom and then minus the bonded which is all unshared electrons yeah all unshared plus one half of all shared electrons yeah so in other words you're basically uh, seeing how much electrons is this associated with uh, in in its molecule st setup so this is nh2 minus so this has a negative uh one uh, net charge and you can calculate that here actually no you're not calculating that this is an nh2 minus of the overall uh, molecule but then if you're calculating the formal charge of this nitrogen specifically to see what charge it has or you could uh, calculate it as then in this case what you'll have here so in this in this molecule and nitrogen has two uh yeah, it has two pairs so one two and then one two here of unshared electrons so that's four electrons in total two pairs and then these these it has hydrogen in in in, uh, in covalent bonds so you take half of those so is there being shared two are being shared so you divide those in half so you have one two three four five six six electrons in this and then the difference between the neutral atom is uh is well five minus one five minus six is going to be negative one so the so the net charge relative to the neutral is negative one so formal charge equals five minus four is the unshared all unshared electrons minus two is half of the shared electrons so four divided by two is uh, two so five minus four minus two is equal to negative one so yes fascinating stuff all right so continue further so uh, and just a further note on the valence and also going over some orbitals and stuff in uh, quantum mechanical uh, uh, setup this is more a simplified model that used to be uh, how electrons uh, and atoms were, were uh, thought to be configured so continue further so a valence electron is an electron in the outer shell associated with an atom 
and that can participate in the formation of a chemical bond uh, if the outer shell is not closed. That is, uh, there is uh, yeah, no un unpaired electrons. Yeah, so if it's closed, that means that it has a whole bunch of uh, paired electrons. And there is none unpaired that you could form bonds with, such as uh, this right here. So these are unpaired right there. So as long as it's not closed off. And continue further. So in a single covalent bond, both atoms in the bond contribute one valence uh, electron in order to form a shared pair. So if hydrogen has one valence, the carbon has four here, so it can share, it can do four covalent bonds. Hydrogen can only do one, so it has four hydrogens there. So there is the electron from hydrogen is in, is in uh, red, and then electron from carbon is in blue. So they're, they're sharing these on the outer edge. So, so four covalent bonds. Carbon has four valence electrons, and here uh, a valence of four. And uh, yeah, the valence is just a measure of its... Um, yeah, of its combining capacity. So here it can combine with four of the hydrogens there. And each hydrogen has one atom, uh, each hydrogen atom has one valence electron and it is univalent or a valence of one. Yeah, so here I just copy and paste the definition. So the valence or valency of an element is the measure of its combining capacity with other, uh, other atoms when it forms chemical compounds or molecules. So yes, uh, hydrogen has one and carbon has four here. Is, yeah, so this one has four here in this case. So going further, a shell, because remember, this, this is in the outer shell, and it's not this simplified like this, just to go over uh, some quantum mechanics for a change. So an outer, an, an electron shell may be thought of as an orbit followed by electrons around an atom's nucleus. The closest shell to the nucleus is called the one shell, also called the K shell, followed by the two shell or L shell, then the three shell or M shell, and so on uh, farther and farther from the nucleus. The shells correspond to the principal quantum numbers uh, n equals one, two, three, four, or are labeled alph alphabetically with the letters used in X-ray notation, which is K, L, M, etc. That's what this one is called, and it's uh, this X-ray notation came up from X-rays or uh, X-ray science. Anyways, continue further. Yeah, so each shell can o can contain only a fixed number of electrons. The first shell can hold up to two electrons. The second shell up to eight, so two plus six. Uh, electrons and the third shell can hold up to 18 so 2 plus 6 plus 10 so it includes the uh, previous ones altogether yeah and so on the general formula is that the nth shell can in principle hold up to 2 times n squared electrons and uh, each shell consists of one or more subshells and each subshell consists of one or more atomic orbitals yeah so here's a comparison between shell subshell versus orbital so shell is a pathway followed by electrons around an atom's nucleus Subshell is a pathway in which an electron moves within a shell, and uh, orbital is a mathematical function that describes the wave-like be wave -like behavior of an electron. Yes, yeah, so basically it doesn't just go in a circle or whatever, or like a, a random particle. This is a yes has a wave-like uh, wave-like or a sine sine function or trigonometric function that you can uh, you can model it as. So it goes as as a wave as opposed to just a simple uh, simple path, a simple circular path. Uh, so then in, in this uh, the shell is given a principal quantum number and this, yeah, that's principal quantum And then the subshell is given the angular momentum quantum number or orbital angular momentum quantum number. Uh, we'll get to that in a bit. And then the orbital is given the magnetic uh, quantum number. And the shell can hold up to a maximum of 32 electrons and subshell can maximum number of electrons. And this can hold, it depends on the type of subshell. And orbital can hold up to a maximum of two electrons. So inside the uh, orbitals, uh, it's moving around, yeah, either by either one or by uh, two electrons at a time. So it's like they're paired. Anyways, continue further. This is from uh, uh, PD, P -E -D -I -A -A com, and it's also from that as well. So, however, one orbital can can hold only a maximum of two electrons. These electrons are on the same energy level, but different from each other according to their spin. They they always have opposite spins. When electrons are filled into the orbitals, they are filled according to Hund's rule. This rule indicates that every orbital in a subshell is singly occupied with electrons before any orbital is doubly uh, doubly coupled. So before you add two electrons, it all they need you need to go one at a time. So one has to go in, and then the second one. And uh, here's some shapes of the orbitals right here. Yeah, and uh, we'll yeah, discuss this one. This is also from the same figure. So shapes of d orbitals. This D is actually, uh, so this is the subshell is over here, D for diffuse, which can hold up uh, up to 10 electrons max. And let's just keep going back here. So it can hold up to 10 max, but then uh, this is when you have coupled, 
or not coupled. This shows the above image shows the shapes of d orbitals. Since one d shell is composed of five orbitals, the above image shows it the five different shapes of these orbitals. So here's different shapes like this. It can be like that. So electron can be found in here, 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 or this in a loop like this. And uh, yeah, so this is the d d orbital or a d subshell. And then these are the different kinds of orbitals: the x z x squared, etc. These are uh, and these. Uh, functions here, xz is x squared minus y squared. These are actually mathematical functions on a spherical surface. So uh, we'll get to that in a bit. So each orbital in an atom is characterized by a set of values of the three quantum numbers, nl and ml, this one ml, uh, m subscript l, which respectively correspond to the electron's energy. That's the principal number, this n. Uh, angular momentum, this one here, l, and an angular momentum, uh, um, angular momentum vector component. Which is considered, which is the uh, magnetic moment, uh, magnetic quantum number. Alternative to the magnetic quantum number, the orbitals are often labeled by the associated harmonic pol polynom uh, polynomials x y x squared minus y squared. So, and these are spherical mathematical functions, or mathematical functions on a spherical surface. And uh, yeah, so these are corresponding to the shapes of these in three D. And yes, you could just use those, or you could use these uh, other uh, m. Uh, uh, you can specify them by these quantum numbers. Yeah. So each such orbital can be occupied by a maximum of two electrons, each of uh, each of its uh, each with its own projection of spin or m s. That's the uh, spin angular momentum. Uh, it's uh, akin to uh, rotation of a just yeah, an object. The simple names s orbital, p orbital, d orbital, and f orbital refer to the orbitals with angular momentum quantum numbers uh, l equals zero, one, two, and three, respectively. So here's just a comparison of a, of, of of a shell orbitals and subshell or subshell and orbitals. So if is, the shell is just everything inside, so it's overall one. And then you have the subshells. It could be in this shape, or it could be in these three types of shapes right here, and the and the orbitals. Is the number of orbitals in each subshell? This can be, can be just a, a simple sphere. This one is uh, this shape right here. And uh, going further here, this is from uh, chemistry.stackexchange.com. And here's another figure from Wikipedia. So you have subshell label S, P, K, B, D, F, G. And then this is the uh, angular momentum uh, quantum number, or the, uh, it's also called the, it's over here, the uh, azimuthal, uh, azimuthal quantum number. Yeah, or uh, as a methyl quantum number, uh, and uh, yeah, going back over, yeah, back over here, we'll go, go to that in a bit. Basically, yeah, so you have the maximum electrons in each subshell or or orbital. So you have two, yeah, subshell, and then each subshell has a uh, has a number of or, or orbitals, and each of those orbitals have two. But then in that subshell, you're gonna have multiple orbitals. So then a total of, in this case, subshell S is as two. So the S has two, then the P has six uh, max electrons and three orbitals. So three times. Uh, three times uh, two is going to be six. And then D is uh, D is uh, has ten electrons max, and that's the D one here is ten electrons max. And these each orbitals has two inside. So then you'll have uh, two times, uh, and there's five of these. So two times five is equal to ten. And then F has fourteen, and then G has eighteen, and then shells containing it. Uh, this every shell has this at least an S orbital, and then every uh, uh, yeah then the second shell and higher have the P inside it's a p and s and the third shell and higher has this d and then including all these and the fourth shell and higher has f and all these and then the fifth has this g and all uh, these uh, fifth shell and higher theoretically yes you can keep going further and then so the historical name is sharp principal diffuse fundamental and then next in alphabetical letter is f now after f uh so then the next in alphabet after f yeah so s p d f and then whatever is uh, after that there's uh, fascinating stuff over here. Let's continue further. And here's just a hydrogen wave function to illustrate the probabilities of, uh, and there's atomic orbitals of the electron and the hydrogen atom at different energy levels or um, or that principal, uh, principal quantum number or, or just the shell, the increase of shell levels. Uh, the probability of finding the electron is given by the color as shown in the key at upper right. So then this one, a higher probability is at this brighter side here and less on this side here. So you can see these different uh, orbital shapes. Yes, fascinating stuff. Yes, continue further. So this, uh, this would uh, definitely be um, yeah something that I need to research in a later video in more detail. So this one I'm just going over it just to give an overview and include that uh, inside. Yeah, this biology video just to give you an idea of uh, well because a lot of a lot of, you're dealing with a lot of chemistry and that's just molecules and atoms and so on. Just to illustrate that it's a more complex uh, model than the simple. Uh, 
simple uh, orbit model. It's a simple planets one. So it's more complicated than this simple setup over here, like that. Anyways, continue further. So it's basically like a wave. Everything is like a wave. A wave of what? The ether. Anyways, uh, the azimuthal uh, quantum number is a quantum number for an atomic orbital that determines its orbital angular momentum and describes the shape of the orbital. The azimuthal quantum number is a second uh, of a set of quantum numbers that describe the unique quantum state in an electron. The others being the principal quantum number, that was a shell shape, uh, the number of shells and so on, or, or just a shell number. And the magnetic quantum number, uh, this is relating to the orbitals themselves and the spin quant quantum number. It is also known as the orbital angular momentum quantum number, orbital quantum number or second quantum number and is symbolized by this L, pronounced L. Uh, quantum numbers describe uh, values of conserved quantities in the dynamics of a quantum system and the magnetic quantum number distinguishes the orbitals ab available within a subshell. So this one is, is about the number of orbitals or, or, or the type of orbital uh, inside this, uh, inside a subshell. So the spin quantum number is a quantum number designated MS, which describes the intrinsic angular momentum or spin angular momentum or simply spin of an electron or other particle. And uh, let's continue here. So the, here's the, the, the shapes of the first five four, uh, orbitals occupied in, in nitrogen. So you have the first one, third, fourth, fifth. So it looks like uh, this shape here. And the two colors show the phase or sign of the wave function in each region from left to right. You have one S and then two S here, two electrons side, cut away to show internal structure yeah, so this is cut in half, so it's actually a sphere. Yeah, that's, that's 2s, and then 2px, and then 2py, and then 2pz there. And uh, here's a figure here just to illustrate the phase. It's from uh, this website right here, uh, csbsju.edu, and it's employees of it. Dot, dot. Anyways, uh, a sine wave showing phase and nodal property. So if you have a sine wave like this, uh, the phase is this negative phase and this positive phase. So it's basically the sine of... The, uh, the the positive or negative sign of the yeah wave function. So this is a this could be a positive or negative, and then the opposite. So blue is either uh, negative or positive, and then these ones are different signs of it, and so on. So fascinating stuff. And the nodes are uh, these uh, endpoints right there before they switch up. Anyways, continue further. So all that just to illustrate that we were dealing with formal charge of the nitrogen uh, atom for the NAD. So if we go back all the way up here. Yeah, just keep scrolling up. So uh, this one right here, um, yeah, so the NAD plus addition sign reflects the formal charge in one of its nitrogen atoms. This species is actually a singly charged anion. So it's, even though the, the overall NAD plus is a is negative uh, ion, uh, yeah, so it's going to be negative charge. And the NADH is a doubly negative charge, so negative two. Uh, nonetheless, we uh, this is used NAD plus, this indication, this one AD, NADH. Where the H has two uh, two electrons, and uh, and that is referring to the formal charge on the hydrogen, uh, I mean on the nitrogen atom. So if you go scroll over here, uh, and now here is the skeletal formula of the oxidized form of uh, NAD. So this is of NAD, and uh, I mean, yeah. so I'll put it like this: NAD, and then plus, and put this as a superscript like that: NAD plus. Yeah, so you have this N plus, so that, that's all it is. <laughs> so it's not actually the full overall thing, because this has a, a net negative charge. And you can see that this is negative there, negative here, there's a plus. And uh, yes, yeah, so overall, it's going to be a negative one. And then uh, to illustrate the redox reactions of uh, nicotinamide adenine uh, dinucleotide, or uh, NAD. So the oxidized form here loses an electron. Yeah, so it loses an electron, and, and then that makes this uh, pl uh, N plus here. But uh, I think it all, yeah, it also uh, loses a hydrogen as well. Uh, hydrogen has two negative charges. Yeah, so, yeah, so it loses a, two, a hydrogen with two negative uh, charges right there. I mean, two uh, negative electrons on it. So, and you can see this reaction here. So NAD plus, plus this hydrogen, which is a plus, uh, but then it has, it has two electrons. So in other words, um, yeah, so in other words, here you're going to have a, this is going to be a, a neutral uh, relative. So the N, N, N plus is going to be gone. So there's no... Uh, there is no charge on this. You have NADH. But if you were going to take away this H, which has two uh, negative charges, yeah, or this uh, H that is a negative charge, uh, you remove that, you're going to be left with an N plus there. So fascinating stuff. And again, notice the difference here. This, uh, If you have this gone, so just uh, cover this up, then you'll have, uh, this can be a negative two charge overall, because there's a negative and negative. But then if you, uh, if you remove that H, uh, that H uh, minus one, 
the negative charge or the hydrogen with a negative charge because of the two electrons, then if you remove that, then you end up with a plus here. So then this is going to be a overall negative uh, one charge. So just fascinating stuff. Okay, going further, so uh, let's look at what uh, this nicodinamide uh, actually is or nicodinamide. So nicod uh, nicodinamine, or actually I think this one is pronounced niacinamide uh, or also the one that uh, I've, we've been using or uh, is uh, just nicotinamide. Or uh, yeah, nicotinamide. And we'll just go with that. Oops. Yeah, so uh, nicotinamide, NAM, is a form of vitamin B3, and, and, and this, this part right here is the nicotinamide, yeah, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. So the reactions of this overall setup here, NAD plus, uh, yeah, NAD or NAD plus NADH. And it's specifically looking at this, this, this setup right here, like that. Yeah, because uh, and if you see how the setup is, it is a dinucleotide, so this is a uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. So then the, uh, the nitrogenous base is adenine, which is a purine with the fused ring there. It has a sugar ribose because it doesn't have the, uh, the deoxy or the removed the, uh, the oxygen. So then it's going to be a ribose. And there's two of these. Uh, it's a two a dinucleotide. It has a phosphate over there. This is a nucleotide. And this could be a nucleotide as well because it has a nitrogenous base. And this one is uh, the nic nicodin uh, nicotinamide. And uh, yeah, so it was a form, and this is a form of bi vitamin B3 found in food and used as a dietary supplement and medication. A chemical formula is C6H6N2O2. So that's the chemical formula of this or this setup. All right, going further. So uh, vitamin B3 uh, is, a vitamin is a vitamin family that includes three forms of vitamins, uh, nicotinamide or uh, niacin. Nice Niacinamide, yeah, niacinamide or niacinamide, and then niacin or uh, uh, nicotin, uh, niacin, yeah, or this one, a uh, niacin, and this is a nicotinic, and then uh, nicotinamide riboside. All three forms of vitamin B3 are converted converted within the body to nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide or NAD. And then, uh, so yeah, so a vitamin, a vitamin is, is an organic molecule or set of molecules closely related chemically. Uh, i.e. vitamins, if you have uh, different types of similar uh, vitamins, that is an essential micronutri micronutrient within an organism, uh, which an organism needs in small quantities for the proper functioning of its metabolism. Essential nutrients cannot be synthesized or created in the organism either at all or not in sufficient oil quantities and therefore must be obtained through the diet. Actually, here I just added another uh, sentence here. Let's quickly copy it and paste it after I pause the video. Uh, so vitamin C, which is C6H8O6, can be th synthesized by some species but not by others. So it is, a, it is not a vitamin in the first instance, but it is in the second. So this is essential nu nutrients uh, or even vitamins. Uh, it depends on the organism. So if it can synthesize it, then it's not a vitamin. But if the organism can't produce, an, uh, produce it or enough of it, then it's considered a vitamin, which needs uh, from external sources. Uh, vitamins can, can vitamins occur in a variety of related forms known as vitamins. Just to put that there. All right, so now let's uh, continue back on track and uh, let's go over uh, this part right here. So each pyruvate is then oxidized into acetyl-CoA, where this is a coenzyme, so acetyl-CH3CO, coenzyme A, uh, by the uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase uh, complex, which is a complex of three enzymes which also generates NADH, which is a coenzyme that I just went over, and carbon dioxide, CO2. And acetyl-CoA uh, enzyme enters a citric acid cycle, which takes place inside the mitochondrial matrix. Yeah, so let's just scroll back up to that diagram and also where we uh, left off before we went over this quantum mechanics and atomic orbitals uh, sidetrack. So let's go all the way back up here. Yeah, so we got to this part. So glycolysis is a metabolic process that occurs in the cytoplasm whereby glucose is converted into two pyruvates, which is this CH3COOO uh, minus, which is, a, again, the conjugate base of pyruvic acid. So scroll up here. So you have here and glycolysis in the cytoplasm, which is inside the cell but outside the nucleus. And then this glucose is converted eventually all the way down to two pyruvates, and you have a net gain of 2 ATP. And uh, now here I just teleported back over it here. Let's just read this uh, paragraph uh, closely again. So each pyruvate is then oxidized into acetyl-CoA uh, by the pyruvate uh, dehydrogenase uh, complex, complex of three enzymes, which also generates NADH. 
and a carbon dioxide CO2. And also just this coenzyme, just to recall what coenzyme is, let's just do a search coenzyme and start from the beginning. And this one right here. So uh, just to uh, recap. So a cofactor is a non-protein chemical compound uh, or metallic ion that require, that is required for an enzyme's activity as a catalyst. And the catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction. So enzyme needs uh, extra cofactors uh, to... Uh, yeah, it, yeah, to uh, to assist an enzyme's activity as a catalyst, and these cofactors can be divided into two types: inorganic ions, which lack CH bonds, and complex organic molecules called coenzymes. So basically, uh, 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 these are helpers. These are organic molecules that help uh, enzymes or are required for an enzyme's activity as a catalyst. Just interesting, uh, interesting stuff. Let's go back over to here. So going all the way back uh, over here should be here. All right, so now that we have this, so basically the pyruvates get into, they get oxidized, uh, which, which involves losing an electron, you know, losing electrons, and becomes into this uh, acetyl-CO, uh, CoA, and then by this complex, uh, and which also generates NADH and CO2. And then this, uh, c this acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle, which takes place inside the mito mitochondrial matrix. So let's see that right now. Let's click uh, pyruvate. To teleport quickly so this should be this one's right here and the next one's gonna be uh, here so we have the two pyruvates so here so we get from glucose uh, and glycolysis in the cytoplasm converts it all the way to two pyruvates and you get two, net gain of two ADP and this goes into the mitochondrial uh, ins inside the mitochondrial matrix or inside the mitochondria and notice that the COA gets out yeah so the pyruvates convert into this as well as you're gonna you're going to produce NADH as well as CO2 waste. Uh, yeah, CO2, carbon dioxide as waste inside this cycle there. And we're going to go over this further here. So let's go back to this. So let's just search pyruvate and teleport all the way over here. All right, so now we're here. So MES note, the citric acid cycle or CAC, also known as the TCA cycle or tri a tricarboxylic acid cycle or the Krebs cycle is a series of chemical reactions to release stored energy through the uh, oxidization or loss of electrons of acetyl CoA derived from carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And uh, here I just added the definition of acetyl CoA or, or acetyl uh, coenzyme A is a molecule that participates in many biochemical reactions and protein, carbohydrate, and lipid metabolism. Its main function is to deliver the acetyl group to the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle to be oxidized for energy production. And uh, let's get a refresher on this acetyl uh, or acetyl. Let's just search it here. So acetyl, we had uh, covered this in the chemistry terms earlier. So acetyl is a moiety with chemical formula CH3CO. And uh, yeah, just uh, if you recall what a moiety is, I think it's, uh, yeah, it should be a part of a chemical formula that is shown in other parts so as an it's given a name so here a moiety is a part of a molecule that is given a name because it is identified as part of other molecules as well all right so now we just teleport all the way back over here so this is the organic uh, compound that's uh, yeah, needed in this uh, citric acid cycle uh, its main function is to deliver this to this uh, Krebs cycle citrus as a cycle to be oxidized for energy production Anyways, going further, uh, just to uh, go over what this, uh, it's inside the mitochondrial matrix. So that's the Krebs cycle uh, takes place in there. So in the mitochondrion, the matrix is a space within the inner membrane. Yeah, so then within the inner membrane, so if this is the, this 3.2 is the matrix, this part right here, this whole thing is the, the matrix inside there. And you can see this inner membrane is right here. So that's inner membrane. So it has two membranes around. So there's a main one out there, the outer membrane. Then you have the uh, inside membrane. And you can see this uh, pores as well. So here's a components of a typical mitochondri uh, mitochondrion. Remember, it has its own genomes. So it has mitochondrial DNA inside here. And there's uh, also some ribosomes in size. Very interesting stuff. And now here's like, this is a model of it. And here is uh, an electron microscope image of this. So you have, yeah, you have these components, but let's just check where this was from. This is from courses.lumenlearning.com. 
And yeah, so we have uh, this is mitochondrial matrix inside that inner membrane. This is a cruste, yeah, or a cruste, yeah, so the cruste, and this is the outer membrane, the inner membrane inside of this. You have this uh, mitochondria, and that's uh, interesting, that's pretty close up there. This one looks a bit further out. And uh, yeah, so continue, that's the uh, inner membrane. Uh, inner membrane is right here, and then the outer membrane is right here. So yes, that's the uh, electron micrograph of it. So this electron micrograph shows a mitochondrium, mitochondrion as viewed with a transmission electron microscope. This organelle has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The inner membrane contain, contains folds called cristi. So note no, that, yeah, this is the inner membrane. Look at that fold inside. You can also see this uh, cristi right here. Is that uh, so? This part right here, and each time of these, yes, yeah, so each fold. So it goes fold, and so you have one fold, two fold, and so on. And then, yeah, this one here is pointing to this, uh, but yeah, so basically where it's fold, you have the cristi, and this one has some over here, I believe, inside here, and uh, there's some somewhere else as well. But yeah, it's just a bit. This is a line like that, but yeah, I believe that these are the, these folds are the cristae. And the idea is that, yeah, so the cristae increases its surface area. The space between the two membranes is called the intermembrane space, and this might have it too, yeah, so this intermembrane space in between that. Yeah, so that, that's it. Yeah, if that's an uh, intermembrane uh, space there, then, uh, yeah, so then the question is, is this the... This that's in between space, but yeah, then these are the folds there. But again, this uh, this this flat line. I'm just not sure why they have a flat line, but yeah. So anyways, the folds are the cristae, uh, like these right here. All right. So the space uh, between the two membranes is called the intermembrane space, and the space inside the intermembrane is called the mitochondrial matrix. ATP synthesis takes place on the inner membrane, and uh, credit modification of work by Matthew Britton, scale bar date. Uh, scale bar data from Matt Russell. This is 200 nm. So number nm is 200 uh, is a billionth of a nanometer. I mean a billionth of a meter, which is absolutely small. Uh, absolutely, yeah, very, very, very small. And yeah, it says here ATP synthesis takes place on the inner membrane. That's interesting. So on the inner membrane is where the ATP gets synthesized. Well, let's go further. So at the end of the cycle, the total yield from one glucose or two pyruvates is 6 NADH, 2 FADH2, and 2 ATP molecules. Finally, the next stage is oxidative phosphorylation, which in eukaryote, uh, eukaryotes occurs in a mitochondrial cristae. So that's very interesting. So let's go back to that uh, diagram and just to see all these. So we total yield from one glucose or two pyruvates is 6 NADH. 2-FADH2 and 2 ATP molecules. So pyruvate, search over here, and that should be uh, right all the way here. Yeah, so we have this cycle right here, and uh, we have, so we have this right here, and let's just uh, search how much we need it again. I just, if you just were to search pyruvate, you could see that over here, so that we were actually over here, so then, uh, the total yield for one glucose or two pyruvate is 6 NADH, 2 FADH2, and 2 ATP uh, molecules. Let's see if we can uh, see that over here. So we get from these two pyruvates goes inside. Let's see how much this shows up here. So we have NADH, we have an NADH, we have an NADH as 3, and then we also have a 1 FADH, and we have these two CO2s there. Uh, so yeah, there's a CO2. Actually, there's not talking about CO2s right here. So we have two ATPs. So there's an ATP right here. And inside this electron transport chain on this inner membrane, you have an ATP there. So that, that could be considered, I think that would be two. It's just uh, hard to uh, analyze this exactly. So yeah, so from, but from this uh, image right here, we get, uh, yes, we get one ATP, because it could be for synthesis, ATP synthesis from the membrane. So if that's from that, if this is the same as this one, then that would mean, yeah, that would mean we get one NADH, another NADH, and another one that's three, and then one here, and then one ATP, and then times it by two. So it might be just doing a cycle. And then you eventually you're going to get six. Yeah, so you'll get six NADH, two F FADH2, and two ATP. So yes, yeah, so, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think that's something like that. Anyways, continue further. All right, so finally, the next stage is uh, oxidative phosphorylation, which is which in eukaryotes it occurs in a mitochondrial cristae, in which are the inner membrane contains folds called cristae, which increase surface area, so those folds inside. 
and that is where here is the next stage uh, of the um, uh, cycle. So uh, uh, oxidative phosphorylation, just let me just note oxidative phosphorylation or, or electron transport length phosphorylation or termin terminal oxidation is, a me is the metabolic pathway in which cells use enzymes to oxidize nutrients. In other words, it's going to take uh, electrons from these nutrients. And when you remove electrons, you increase their oxidative, uh, oxidation state. Uh, there, thereby releasing the chemical energy stored within the nutrients in order to produce adenotriphosphate, ATP, so oxidative phosphorylation. So basically, you are uh, oxidizing. You're taking electrons out or electron transport length phosphorylation. Let's continue further. So, uh, and then this right here, also this FAD, because we have this FADH2. Uh, yeah, from this uh, uh, FADH2. So let's read this one here. So FAD or flavin adenine uh, dinucleotide is a redox active coenzyme associated with various proteins, which is involved in several enzymatic reactions in, metabol in, in metabolism uh, or metabolism. FAD can exist in four redox states, which are the flavin N5 oxide uh, or the quinone or semi quinone. Yeah, semiquinone or and a hydroquinone, uh, yeah, uh, states like that. And FAD is converted between these states by accepting or donating electrons. And FAD in its fully oxidized form, so fully oxidized, yeah, and it's a oxidized form or a quinone form. So FAD is it's in the oxidized form that it, that's lost electrons. Uh, it accepts two electrons and two protons to become FADH two, which is the hydroquinone uh, form so it's except except protons and electrons there to become this so, uh, fad is is the quinone or fully oxidized with so lost electrons and if it accepts electrons it becomes fadh2 so this one right here and this is an important coenzyme that's fascinating stuff all right let's continue further so oxidative phosphorylation comprises the electron ele the electron transport chain which is a series of four protein complexes that transfer electrons from one complex to another, thereby releasing energy from uh, NADH and FADH2. Yes, yeah, so basically, yeah, it takes protons from those uh, that is coupled to the pumping of protons, hydrogen ions across the inner mitochondrial membrane uh, called uh, uh, chemiosmosis. Yeah, or chemiosmosis is the form of it, uh, which generates a proton mode of force. So, uh, chemio, uh, chemio, uh, chemiosmosis is a movement of ions across a semi-permeable membrane uh, bound structure down their electro electrochemical gradient. An example of this would be the formation of ad uh, adenosine triphosphate ATP by the movement of hydrogen ions across a membrane during cellular respiration or photosynthesis. So if you have a low ion concentration right here and you have a membrane and there's a transport uh, protein right there and then, and then this, this higher concentration of ion concentration will push this over to this side here. So, so chemiosmosis is the movement of ions across the semi-permeable membrane. Yeah, that only allows, uh, the, let's say these ions, it's gonna go through, uh, it's, it's gonna go through to the lower concentration. And ion gradient has potential energy, can be used to power chemical reactions when the ions pass through a channel or pore forming uh, membrane proteins in red. So it's a, yeah, a, a, a pore forming membrane. So it's basically a hole, a hole in the membrane. Uh, the, the formed by these proteins and the protein mode of force pmf is the measure of the potential energy stored as a combination of proton and voltage which is electric potential gradients across a membrane and voltage uh, or electric potential difference electric pressure or electric tension is a difference in electric potential between two points which in a static electric field is defined as the work needed per unit of charge to move a test charge between the two points and uh well, for the test particle or test charge is an idealized model of an object whose physical properties, usually mass, charge, or size, are assumed to be negligible except for the property being studied, which is considered to be insufficient to alter the behavior of the rest of the system. In simulations with, le with electric fields, the most important characteristics of a test particle is its electric charge and its mass. In this situation, it is, it is often referred to as a test charge. Yeah, so basically test particle or test charge is looking at only a specific uh, important part of the uh, important property. So in this case, uh, in test particle, in this case, it just wants to care about the test charge. So ignoring the mass and so on. So it's the work needed to uh, needed per unit of charge to move a test charge. So basically how many charges are near there and how much it can move this uh, hypothetical charge that ignores mass and, and speed and so on, momentum.
or its size and so on. So just a simplified uh, point charge and see how, uh, how much work is needed or how much energy is needed to move it between two points. And that amount of energy is, um, or potential energy is, uh, it's called voltage or electro potential difference or just uh, electric pressure, how much, it, how much pressure it can uh, potentially move a test charge or a charge. And uh, now let's look at that, uh, that, um, yeah, that electron transport chain. So this is all oxidative phosphorylation is moving electrons and protons uh, to yeah to get energy from this NADH and, and FADH2. So let's just search this over pyruvate. That's where the last word was there. So pyruvate. Uh, we can go right here. And so we scroll up. So here's the electron transport chain. So we have NADH and then plus a, a hydrogen right here. And then also the electron goes through this. Uh, across this membrane all the way across here yeah so this electron transport chain right here it's transporting electrons from NADH and FADH2 and then when you're removing the electrons you're going to get this FAD the uh, fully oxidized form and in this process it's also removing the the hydrogens from them and it's going to go uh, fly up there so when you're removing a charge there this plus charge it's now linked to it so I assume that's how it works and then it pumps this a hydrogen up so it's a, it's a proton pump so hydrogen pump gets pumped over there and then this hydrogen pumping over there is able to synthesize ATP in this reaction because now you have a bunch of electrons moving you can move you get some uh, water uh, byproduct and as well as you can have uh, other uh, ATP, ADP plus phosphate and you have a two hydrogen right here inside this and you could form ATP a hyd uh, adeno tri triphosphate this, which is uh, quite amazing. So that's that's uh, inner thin thin membrane. That's all that happens. Again, this is a uh, keep that in mind. That's the theory of it. I'll just see how it'll be interesting to see how they would uh, allege to prove it. Because given that, let's go back over here. We're, we're scrolling up. Should be scrolling down. So let's just scroll all the way to pyruvate. Okay. So let's go back over here. Yeah. So the uh, uh, let's go back to the mitochondrion. Because remember, that's all that's happening in the inner membrane. So here's a model of it. Here's the inner membrane, and now here's the <laughs> electron micrograph. And this is remember, a dead image uh, that's uh, usually heavy heavy metal stained. And using electron micrograph, so it's super super small. This is a billionth, two hundred uh, nanometers a meter. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So you're going absolutely super tiny. So all this is happening in, <laughs> in this uh, membrane, supposedly. But nonetheless, this video is about the mainstream uh, science of it, so or mainstream uh, narrative of all of this uh, biology. So very interesting to uh, grasp. All right, so uh, continuing further. So energy from the proton motive force drives the enzyme ATP synthase to synthesize more ATPs by phosphorylating ADP. So that's the diphosphate and this is the triphosphates. And let me just note, ATP, ATP synthase is a protein that catalyzes the formation of the energy storage molecule adenosine triphosphate or ATP using adenosine diphosphate ADP and an inorganic phosphate PI. So it combines these two reactions. And uh, let's just quickly go uh, recap on this inorganic phosphate. Let's just search it up here. We mentioned it earlier in the important terms. So right here, so free, uh, free phosphate ions and where phosphate ion is this right here. Yeah, where phosphate is a derivative of phosphoric acid. And so here's phosphoric acid right here and with the chemical formula H3PO4. So a derivative of that. And it is, yeah, and it involves uh, basically uh, something like, uh, well, one, one case is where you remove three protons, you get a phosphate. So if you remove these uh, H3 right there, uh, from the PO4s, you just get this PO4 and then uh, negative uh, three charge and continue further. So just re recap now, free phosphate ions and anions in solution are called inorganic phosphate, generally denoted PI and at physiological or homeostatic or steady internal uh, conditions. Yes, yeah, so physiological pH primarily consists of a mixture of HPO4 2 minus and H2PO4 uh, minus ions. Yeah, so it's generally uh, formed. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is just inorganic phosphate. That's what it's called when you just have a free phosphate ions in solution, and they're generally these right here. This HPO4 2 minus that is a yeah, that's a hydrogen phosphate. That's an H right there, and then if you have two right there, that's a dihydrogen phosphate. And if you remove all three, you just get a phosphate without the uh, hydrogen there. So yes, so inorga inorganic phosphate is just uh, mainly these right here, just uh, free. 
uh, phosphate anions. Yeah, so it has one, uh, so it has one or two hydrogens removed from phosphoric acid. So yes, fascinating, fascinating stuff. All right, so now we're back here. So basically, ATP uh, synthase uh, protein that catalyzes formation of energy storage molecule ADP using ADP. So uses a diphosphate plus the uh, inorganic phosphate PI. So basically, adding a phosphate group to ADP to create this triphosphate. So as diphosphate plus a phosphate, you get a triphosphate. So and phosphorylation. So this is phosphorylating ADPs as a molecule. Uh, a phosphorylation of a molecule is the attachment of a phosphoryl group, and a phosphoryl group is a chemical ion or radical P plus O3 2 minus containing phosphorus and oxygen. And uh, this process and its inverse dephosphorylation are critical for many cellular processes in biology. So basically, adding so, uh, adding chemical uh, molecule like so, something like this P plus O3 2 minus, and we'll get to what a radical is soon. So in biochemistry, dephosphorylation is a removal of a phosphate or PO PO43 uh, minus group from an inorganic uh, from from an organic compound by hydrolysis. And then here, I just quickly added the definition of hydrolysis. I did mention it earlier, but let's just add it here. So hydrolysis from ancient Greek, hydro, uh, meaning water, and lysis, meaning to unbind, is it any chemical reaction in which a molecule of water breaks one or more chemical bonds. Yeah, so basically, dephosphorylation involves uh, water breaking the bonds to remove this phosphate of an organic compound. So anyways, let's continue further. So here's a phosphoryl group. It looks like something like this. We have P and then three O's, and these are two charges there. And this is a phosphate group. The difference between a phosphoryl and a phosphate yeah, is uh, this one here has yeah this this bond is to an oxygen and then the, then to other stuff like there. So this is four oxygens. So this is number eight P O four three minus. This is P plus O three two minus. This is two minus there. And uh, this one is uh, this could be three minus or two minus as a phosphate group. So you can have different uh, kinds of uh, charges. So anyways, going back to a radical because this one is a radical. So a phosphoryl group is this radical P plus O three two minus. And a radical is an atom, molecule, or ion that, that has at least one unpaired valence electron. Yeah, so it's just unpaired valence electron. Here's an example. So this is HO uh, right here. So, uh, or OH, uh, the hydroxyl radical uh, OH contains one unpaired electron. So no, this one's unpaired right here. So is, these have two there. It's unpaired right there. All right, so fascinating stuff. So now, uh, so now we have this part right here. It's energy from proton motor force, uh, so the PMF drives ATP synthase synthesize more ATPs by phosphorylating ADP. So let's go to that uh, that figure again. So pyruvate, uh, this is where that figure is. Uh, I think it's over here. So we have to scroll above now. So here is where we have, yeah, so here's where we have the uh, electron transport chain on the inner membrane of the mitochondria uh, or mitochondria. And so what we have is the electrons from NADH are, are transported across and that involves also removing an H plus the, the proton or the hydrogen, and it pumps over here. So it pumps on this side, and then this uh, yeah this excess energy of the proton motive force it causes uh, some hydrogens to pump down in here, and now you have this ADP plus this yeah proton motive force energy, or, or, which includes a two H uh, plus, and then plus this phosphate right here, the inorganic phosphate PI. And what ends up happening is you this gets uh yeah this ADP gets phosphorylated or adds a phosphate group or phosphor a phosphoryl group and and then uh, combines and then gets AD, ATP yeah so that energy mo uh, molecule so basically a diphosphate plus a phosphate you get ADP and it just all involves using this uh, hyd this hydrogen pump here or this uh, proton motor force that that has excess protons over there and pu pumps it down in this side right here so. Yes, fascinating, fascinating stuff. All right, so yeah, that was a pretty good overview. Let's continue further, and we go all the way over to here. So the transfer of electron terminates with molecular oxygen being the final electron acceptor. And uh, again, uh, note note also why the term oxidation because oxygen, uh, yeah, so it it usually yeah oxidizes or takes electrons from others. So it it takes it so oxidizes other molecules by reducing itself. By uh, gaining the, those electrons, so it's accepting the electrons and it's making the other oxidation state increase. So, anyways, continue further. So, if oxygen were not present, pyruvate would not be metabolized by cellular respiration, but undergoes a process of fermentation, and the pyruvate is not transported into the mitochondrion, but remains in a cytoplasm where it is converted to waste products that may be removed from the cell. Yeah, and uh, now let's just quickly recap on fermentation. This was just before the section started, so let's go all the way over here. So, MES note. So fermentation is a metabolic process that produces 
uh, chemical changes in organic substrates through the action of enzymes. So in biochemistry, it is narrowly defined as the extraction of energy from carbs in the absence of oxygen. So use enzymes instead of oxygen. And in this case, we're dealing with biochemistry. So we'll be uh, basically this definition is is more applicable in our case. So basically extraction of energy from carbs or sugar, etc. in the absence of oxygen. All right, so we are back here. So if oxygen were not present, pyruvate would not be metabolized by cellular respiration, but undergoes a process of fermentation. The pyruvate is not transported into the mitochondrion, but remains in the cytoplasm where it is converted to waste products that may be removed from the cell. This serves the purpose of oxidizing the electron carriers so that they can perform glycolysis again and removing the excess pyruvate. Yeah, so then this, this process of removing the waste, uh, converting uh, the yeah, pyruvate to waste involves also absorbing the electrons. So now you'll, you'll have more electron carriers and they can perform like glycolysis. So electron carriers like, uh, like oxygen, but in this case without oxygen, you're going to be you know, generating that electron, uh, electron transport chain, which, also, which then involves the hydrogen pump. Let's continue further. So fermentation oxidizes NADH to NAD+. Plus. So it removes these uh, these electrons and that hydrogen, um, and you get this NAD plus, so that it can be reused in glycolysis. So MES note post glycolysis processes. Yeah. So the overall process of glycolysis is this: just overview. So you have glucose plus two NAD plus plus two ADP plus two PI, which is the organic phosphates. So then there's diphosphate plus two uh, five phosphates. You get two ATP formed. And then you also have two pyruvates and two NADH plus two H plus. Yeah, so it needs this NAD to form these ADP. So if glycolysis were to continue indefinitely, all of the NAD plus would be used up. So all this would be used up and glyco glycolysis would stop. To allow glycolysis to continue, or, or organisms must be able to oxidize NADH back to NAD plus. You need this need this over here need to get from here all the way back to this nad plus yeah so how this is performed depends on which external electron ex uh, acceptor is available one method of doing this is simply to have the pyruvate do the oxidation in this process pyruvate is converted to lactate which is the conjugate base of lactic acid which is this uh this uh, this chemical formula ch3 ch and then oh and then cooh and this is a process called lactic acid fermentation. Yeah, so basically it would have these py pyruvates to do the oxidation of, of this one. So this one to do the oxidation of this NADH to get back to here so that you could continue the glycolysis, the converting the, uh, the sugar into uh, pyruvates and ADP for further, yeah, for further cycling uh, into the... Uh, the citric acid cycle and so on. So, so here is the uh, formation right here. So, you simply have the pyruvate do the do the oxidation. So, you have pyruvate plus NADH plus H plus. So, this right here. So, you have a pyruvate plus NADH plus this H plus, and then it combines to make lactate plus NAD plus. So, you get this NAD plus from there. And uh, this process occurs in the bacteria involved in making yogurt. And the lactic, lactic acid causes the milk to curdle or thicken. So yes, uh, so the oxidization of NADH by pyruvate to get this NAD plus to continue glycolysis, uh, this involves this formation of lactate. And this could be seen in, when you make yogurt, when you have the bacteria yeah, that make yogurt, and then uh, that lactic acid uh, causes the milk to curdle or thicken up. So you could then see that. And uh, this process also occurs in animals under hypoxic or partially anaerobic conditions, yeah, which is uh, low oxygen conditions uh, found, for example, in overworked muscles that are starved of oxygen. Yeah, so when you have uh, when you're super exhausted and working out, and uh, yes, you'll have the lactic acid buildup when when there's uh, very little oxygen. So then the pyruvate itself that oxidizes the NADH to get the back to this NAD plus, yeah, to continue producing energy from the sugar. Yeah, so in many tissues, this is a cellular last resort for energy. Most animal tissue cannot toler tolerate anaerobic conditions for an extended period of time. And uh, here's added the definition here. So anaerobic uh, means uh, living, active, uh, or occurring or existing in the absence of free, free oxygen, as opposed to aerobic, which means living, active, or occurring only in the presence of oxygen. And now here's a, a comparison of respiration versus fermentation. So you have an organic compound 
and then gets to glycolysis right here to get the yeah, convert sugar to energy. So uh, it, then it goes to, yeah, it, it produces pyruvic acid or the pyruvates plus two ATPs. So then the question is if there's oxygen. If there is, then it goes yes. Respiration and respiration get up to uh, 36 ADP. You also have CO2 and, uh, and water as uh, byproducts. And this is throughout that whole cycle. And now this figure is from this right here. This is uh, quizlet.com. Just an interesting image. And then if it, there's no oxygen, it gets fermentation. Then you get lactic acid or ethanol buildup. So, well, one or the other. Uh, so, let's go further. So, in the absence of oxygen, fermentation prevents the buildup of NADH in the cytoplasm and provides NAD plus for glycolysis. Uh, this waste product varies depending on the organism. In skeletal muscles, which are muscles connected to bones, the waste product is lactic acid. So, the C CH3, CH, OH, COOH. This type of fermentation is called lactic acid fermentation in strenuous intense exercise which which when energy demands exceed energy supply the respiratory chain cannot process all of the hydrogen atoms joined by nadh and then during anaerobic or without oxygen glycolysis nad plus regenerates when pairs of hydrogen combine with pyruvate to form lactate which is the conjugate base of lactic acid and then remember the acid is uh, something that wants to wants to donate protons and then once it donates a proton, it, it, it becomes its conjugate base, which want, which can uh, accept a proton. Yeah, and, and hence why, yeah, uh, hence why you have this hydrogen right here combines with this pyruvate, and you'll have a, a byproduct where this lactate is, uh, yeah, so it's missing its hydrogen. Hence a conjugate uh, base. So yes, of the acid, of the acid, uh, lactic acid. Yeah, right here. So going for the so lactate formation is catalyzed by lactate dehydro dehydrogenase, which is another enzyme in a reversible reaction. Lact lactate can also be used as an indirect precursor for liver glycogen. And uh, I must note, so, uh, glycogen is a multi-branch polysaccharide of glucose that serves as a form of energy storage in animals, fungi, uh, and bacteria. The polysaccharide structure represents the main storage form of glucose in the body. So it stores the uh, sugar uh, inside this yeah, multi multi-branched uh, carbohydrate uh, called glycogen, and it's and the, uh, this uh, polysaccharide structure represents the main storage form of of uh, glucose in the body. Due to the way glycogen is synthesized, every glyco glycogen granule has it has at its core a a glyco a glycogenin uh, enzyme or a, a glycogenin protein which is an enzyme so every every one of these has at its core and here is a shape of this so schematic two-dimensional cross-sectional view of glycogen a core protein of gly glycogenin yeah i think it's just pronounced like glycogenin yeah so it's surrounded by branches of glucose units so it combines all these together and that is just the structure so that's a glycogen is this glucose in a, in a, a big structure then you also have the um, a glycogen and enzyme or protein inside the center there. So the entire globular or global or spherical granule may contain around 30,000 glucose units. Very interesting. And glycogen function as one of two forms, forms of energy reserves, glycogen being for short term and the other being triglyceride or fats stored in adipose tissue, i.e. body fat, for long-term storage. So short term is this is a, a glycogen uh, structure uh, of a structure setup where you're combining a whole bunch of glucose or smaller carbs together. Uh, in humans, glycogen is made and stored primarily in the cells of the liver and skeletal muscle. Uh, the uh, liver is an organ only found in vertebrates, which detoxifies various metabolites, synthesizes proteins, and produces biochemicals necessary for digestion and growth. And so here is the liver here, where and there is some other. Uh, some other organs inside. There's a small intestine. You got the big one is, is out, uh, out over here. You have the bladder, stomach, spleen, and so on. Skull bladder and appendix. Very interesting. Appendix is this very end piece of this one. Right. Anyways, we may go through some of these later in the videos. Let's continue further. So this is. Let's make this. Uh, let's see, make this delete. Delete. We can make this a bit bigger, maybe. Yeah, make it right here. So the human liver is located in the upper right ab uh, admin, uh, or abdomen, which is a midsection of the body. So upper right here, if you're looking at it from uh, this person's view. So here's our left, but his, oh yeah, his right. Anyways, continue further. 
Yeah, so during recovery, when oxygen becomes available, NAD plus attaches to hydrogen from lactate uh, to form ATP. And uh, in yeast or single cell, which are single celled eukaryote, uh, eukaryotes, uh, which is a type of fungus, uh, we'll go to those uh, later. Yeah, so the waste products are ethanol and carbo carbon dioxide. So there is that ethanol. So it could be either this alcohol ethanol or this carbon dioxide um, uh, waste products. And and this type of fermentation is known as alcoholic or ethanol fermentation. And so see that diagram earlier. So it could be a fermentation could create either ethanol or lactic acid. So type of, depending on the organism and possibly other factors. Yeah, so the ATP generated in this process is made by substrate level phosphorylation, which does not require uh, oxygen. So ethanol is a simple uh, alcohol with the chemical formula C2H6O. In chemistry, alcohol is an, uh, an organic compound or an, an alcohol is an organic compound that carries at least one hydroxyl functional group. So this OH bound to a saturated carbon atom. The term originally referred to the primary alcohol ethanol or which is a or ethyl alcohol which is used as a drug and is the main alcohol present in alcoholic drinks all right now let's look at substrate level phosphorylation this is a, a this is a metabolism reaction that results in a production of atp or gtp by trans by the transfer of a phosphate group from a substrate or a chemical substance being observed directly to adp or gdp so this is directly from this one here. So there is no free phosphate around that you can grab it. So substrate level phosphorylation exemplified with the conversion of ADP to ATP. So you have the, if you have this molecule right here where this phosphate is attached to this molecule and then ADP plus this become, forms uh, ATP and you also have this uh, hydroxyl group um, yeah, byproduct right there. And here's just an example or a comparison here. This is from differencebetween.com. It's a very interesting site. So here is phosphorylation, ADP plus P in solution, uh, and then ATP, you get that. But then this is a, a substrate level, so that ADP plus takes this uh, PO3, this phosphate, from this molecule. And then it gets a ATP plus this hydroxyl group uh, waste product. And uh, go further, here's another figure. This one is from this uh, blog, blogspot.com, this uh, WASFA-HD. Uh, dot blockspot.com. So, uh, substrate level phosphorylation occurs in both glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. In order to make adeno, adenosine triphosphate, a phosphate group is taken from an intermediate compound referred to as a substrate and given to an ADP molecule. And then it uses the enzyme here. So, they have the enzyme, speeds up the reaction. So, you have a substrate right here, and then takes the P from the, the phosphate and then into ADP, and then you get this product, uh, the, the byproduct plus ATP, the energy molecule. And just to go over back here, so this type of fermentation just during recovery when oxygen becomes available, NAD plus attaches to hydrogen to, uh, to form lactate uh, to form ATP. In yeast, though, the waste products are ethanol and carbon dioxide, and this type of fermentation is known as uh, alcoholic or ethanol fermentation. The ATP generated in this process is made by substrate level phosphorylation, which does not require oxygen. Yeah, so this phosphorylation does not require oxygen. This is the uh, in yeast and so on and other organisms. All right, so continue further. This one is a GTP. This is from uh, over here. So uh, substrate level phosphorylation is a reaction that involves production of ATP or GTP by transfer of phosphate group from the substrate directly to ADP or GDP. So yeah, similar stuff over there. So uh, GDP is a, a guanosine or a guanosine. Actually, it's a, or, or guanosine uh, 5 dash, uh, triphosphate or GDP is a purine nucleoside triphosphate. Actually, uh, the other one is as well, the adenosine. Uh, adenosine. Yeah, because the, uh, the adenosine is also a, um, yeah, a, a purine. So it has a fused ring right here. So fused ring as opposed to the uh, pyrimidine, pyrimidine, which is just a simple ring structure. So this is a fused ring in the nucleo base or, or the nitrogenous base. So it is one of the building blocks needed for the synthesis of RNA during the, during the transcription, or which is the copying of DNA segment into RNA. So the transcription process. It also has the role of a, uh, it also has a role of a source of energy or an activator of substrates in metabolic reactions like that of ATP, but more specific. So it's a more specific energy, um, energy as a currency function. It is used as a source of energy for protein synthesis and gly uh, glycod yeah, or uh, glyconeogenesis. We'll get to that in a bit. So here's a guanosine uh, or guanosine uh, diphosphate, 
and which is a just abbreviated GDP is a purine nucleoside diphosphate. So basically, it has this is triphosphate, this is diphosphate. You have one of the uh, phosphates removed. It's similar to a ATP. So here's GTP uh, versus GDP. So there's diphosphate two, and there's triphosphate three, and there's the nucleus in, uh, hydrogenous base right here, the nucleoside. Oh, no, that's a nucleobase. Nucleoside includes the, includes the sugar. This is the ribose sugar. All right, so now let's go further and now look at uh, glyconeogenesis or GNG. And the reason for this is uh, over here again. Uh, so GTP is, uh, yeah, is used as source of energy for protein synthesis and glyconeogenesis. Just go over this quickly. So glyconeogenesis is a metabolic pathway that results in the, in the generation of glucose from certain non-carbohydrates or uh, non-carbohydrate non carbon substrate. So it's getting, uh, it's... Um, yeah, getting glucose or creating glucose not from uh, not from uh, carbs or saccharides, so something else like uh, like amino acids and so on. So going further, so um, it is a ubiquitous or wide or widespread or widely used, uh, etc. Process present in plants, animals, fungi, uh, bacteria, and other microorganisms. In vertebrates, uh, gl glyconeogenesis occurs mainly in the liver and to a lesser extent in the kidneys. We'll go over the kidneys. Uh, later in this uh, video. So uh, here, here's an, a, di a simplified diagram. So simplified glyconeogenesis pathway as occurs in humans and acetyl-CoA derived from fatty acids dotted lines may be converted to pyruvate to a minor extent under conditions of fasting. Yeah, so you have uh, glycolysis here with amino acids and glycerol to form uh, this uh, uh, glucose 6-phosphate and uh, this is, occurs in the liver and the kidneys and then basically um, the process is to create this glucose, for, so from non-carbohydrates, glycerol, amino acids, and here fatty acids. So and lactate as well. Is a, here's another pathway. So you have lactate going to pyruvate and amino acids, and also fatty acids to acetyl CoA to a lesser extent, uh, going up here, and it's maybe converted to pyruvate to a minor extent under conditions of fasting or where you're not eating for extended periods of time. All right, uh, let's continue further. So now this one's uh, ethanol fermentation. Here's a uh, figure of it. Let's go back to this uh, ethanol fermentation uh, right up over here. So, yeah, so in yeast, single or single-celled eukaryotes type of fungus, the waste products are ethanol and carbon dioxide. This type of fermentation is known as alcoholic or ethanol fermentation. The ADP generated in this process is made by substrate-level phosphorylation, which does not require oxygen. So it's for yeast right here. And also, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put uh, make some space between this because these are uh, separate sentences right here. Yeah, in fact, actually, I think the sentence is better uh, better just put it all the way up on top. It's going to make some yes yeah, so adjustments in real time here. <laughs> just put it here, a better fitting right there. So yes, yeah, so, uh, so lactate can also be used as an indirect precursor for liver glycogen, and then during recovery, when oxygen becomes available, NAD plus attaches to hydrogen from lactate to form ATP. So yes better cohesion over here and and then in next uh the next sentences are relating to this process right here which is a uh, ethanol fermentation so alcoholic or ethanol fermentation then here's a diagram of ethanol fermentation that's uh, right here so ethanol fermentation uh one and here's a figure right here a glucose molecule is broken down via glycolysis yielding two pyruvate molecules uh or pyruvate uh molecules so you have right here glucose uh, then you get two ADP in this process uh, plus two uh, phosphates. You get two ATP, and you get two pyruvates here. And then you also have NAD plus turns into NADH. And then the next, uh, so the energy released by these exothermic reactions is used to uh, phosphorylate two ADP. So uh, I'll phosphorylate this one uh, molecules yielding two ATP molecules, and to reduce two molecules of NAD plus. So you have two of these actually. Not just one, and then uh, to NADH. So this is to reduce these by adding electrons to them, and it goes uh, over here. Then, then the two pyruvate molecules are broken down, yielding two acetyl uh, acetylide, or let's uh, try that again. So acetaldehyde, or uh, also also called ethanol, and uh, the uh, the formula is CH3CHO molecules, and giving off two molecules of carbon dioxide. So you form this extra molecule, two of these, and two carbon dioxide that's waste. And let's see what's next one here. So then step two, yeah, so this is step two. Yeah, we just got that one off. And then step three is over here. 
And step three is the, the two molecules of NADH reduce the two uh, ac acetaldehyde molecules to two molecules of ethanol. This converts NAD plus back uh, into NAD. This is a plus like that, back into NADH. So basically it, get, it uses these, yeah, which has electrons here inside because it's uh, it reduced the NAD plus by adding electrons to it. So now this is used to reduce the uh, two acetaldehydes by giving these electrons to here. So it's, it's oxidation state reduces and you've formed ethanol in there. So it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. All right, uh, now an, an, uh, one last uh, topic to uh, cover uh, or concept is uh, anaerobic respiration just into, and then go over the differences between uh, fermentation and anaerobic respiration. Let's go back to that chart right here. Yeah, so this chart is respiration versus fermentation. So you have organic compound glycolysis, then you have pyruv uh, pyruvic acid. It gets it forms this or pyruvates, and then two ATPs. And so if there's oxygen, you get uh, cellular respiration with oxygen. If not, this one has fermentation, and there's two types: lactic acid or ethanol. And um, another one you could actually have is uh, is yeah is uh, uh, anaerobic uh, yeah anaerobic uh, uh respiration so a respiration without oxygen but not necessarily fermentation so we'll go back over to here just to illustrate it and go over the differences of it so anaer anaerobic respiration is respiration using electron acceptors other than molecular oxygen although oxygen is not the final electron acceptor the process still uses a re respiratory uh yeah, electron transport chain a respiratory electron transport chain. So use that, but doesn't use oxygen as the acceptor. Yeah, so and here's a discussion on uh, differences between anaerobic respiration and fermentation. So anaerobic uh, cellular, cellular respiration and fermentation generate ATP in very different ways, and the terms should not be treated as synonyms. Uh, cellu cellular respiration, both aerobic and anaerobic, uses highly reduced chemical compounds such as NADH and FADH2. Yeah, for example, uh, yeah, for example, produced during glycolysis and the citric acid cycles. These are highly reduced. They've accepted a lot of electrons to establish an electrochemical gradient, often a proton gradient across a membrane. So these are uh, accepting a whole lot of electrons. You can have a gradient, a, a yeah, electrochemical gradient, and then whenever you have a gradient, uh, you get diffusion or or um, or a force or motion of uh, of liquids, or in this case, charges of, of chemicals and proton gradient across a membrane. This results in an electric potential or ion concentration difference across the membrane, and the reduced chemicals compounds are oxidized by a series of respir respiratory integral membrane proteins, uh, which sequentially increase uh, in with sequential sequentially increasing reduction potentials. Yeah, with the final electron uh, acceptor being oxygen in aerobic respiration or another chemical substance in an anaerobic respiration. Uh, so in other words, yeah, you have, you're basically, you have a whole bunch of um, uh, molecules that are able to reduce themselves by oxidizing the highly reduced uh, chemicals uh, such as NADH and FADH. So basically it, it's moving the trans, uh, it's transporting the electrons from these across a whole bunch of molecules that have a gradient of increasing uh, potential to uh, reduce themselves, or in other words, oxidize the other uh, molecules. Here, the final electron acceptor being oxygen in anaerobic, uh, in, I mean, in aerobic respiration, or another chemical substance in, in anaerobic respiration, so not oxygen. And a proton motor force drives protons, as I showed earlier, down the gradient across the membrane through the proton channel of ATP synthase, which is the enzyme in, uh, in synthesizing ATP. And the resulting current drives ATP synthesis from ADP and inorganic phosphate. And uh, yeah, so the difference between fermentation though is fermentation in contrast does not use an electrochemical gradient. Fermentation instead only uses substrate level phosphorylation to produce ATP. The electron acceptor NAD plus is regenerated from NADH formed in oxidative steps of the fermentation pathway by the reduction of oxidized com uh, component, uh, uh, compounds. These oxidized compounds are often formed during the fermentation uh, pathway itself, but may also be external. Yeah, so notice the difference. Fermentation uh, uses substrate level phosphorylation directly to produce ATP, and then it, uh, yeah, and it, the electron acceptor NAD plus uh, is regenerated from NADH.
by this one removing uh removing uh, oxygen in, in oxidative steps and so on let's now yeah let's just uh, scroll up to see that uh electron transport chain again so i think it's right pyruvate search it here and go scroll up all the way here yeah so you have this process of nadh these are highly reduced um compounds as well as fadh2 and then so they're highly reduced they have an electron uh, gradient there and then these uh, transport chain uh these protein uh, pathway molecules are causing yeah the electrons to be reduced from these yeah you know, uh, from these molecules and then uh, as well as creating a gradient where the these uh protons pump outwards yeah so i think the process is if you have electrons being taken out and these protons want to follow the uh the opposite charge and it gets through here and it gets sucked out over there's so a pumped over across and then you have a gradient where you have a lot of uh, protons here and then you have the ATP, ATP synthase uh, that is the protein that's uh, that acts as an enzyme in the uh, ATP uh, synthesis and basically goes in here so this is the ATP synthesis over here where the protons the there's a lot of protons there now they want to it diffuse away so it goes through here and you get a process where you get the protons plus ADP plus uh, free phosphate or inorganic phosphate uh, ions in here and they uh, c uh, they react together or c combine together get atp yeah so this one is uh for anaerobic respiration so uh, where the final acceptor you know final acceptor is not oxygen so in in this pathway here goes all the way across to this point so this tra tra transport chain stops for aerobic uh, tra respiration yeah aerobic respiration you have o2 is a final electron uh acceptor right here and for uh, anaerobic one it's not o2 so basically, it's uh, yeah, it's not oxygen as the final uh, the final electron acceptor. So now let's look at the uh, just quickly the um, the fermentation that that uses substrate level. So just search substrate. Yeah, so substrate and substrate level. So we go over here substrate level phosphorylation, and this is in the fermentations. So you have a, a molecule like this, and then it ta ADP takes the phosphate from it directly at ATP, as opposed to that process where it had that free phosphate or the inorganic phosphate with ADP using the proton motive of force across the electron transport chain. Anyways, that is very fascinating, fascinating stuff.